On this Tuesday night, inside the rubble of a Ukrainian mall obliterated by Russia. They like kill people. The desperate search for survivors and pleas for peace. Arshan O'Shea is at the scene. Breaking news about British Columbia's premier. John Horgan's sudden announcement about his resignation. Stunning testimony about Donald Trump. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president. Take me up to the Capitol now. What he allegedly did inside the presidential limo on January 6th. And reaching for the moon again. NASA's high hopes for a return visit. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Colleen Christie. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Top officials, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, are in Madrid tonight ahead of the NATO summit there. They're united in their support for Ukraine, galvanized following Russia's deadly attack on a shopping mall in the central part of the country. Crews continue to dig through what's left of the mall in the city of Kremenchuk, hit by a Russian missile late yesterday. At least 18 people are dead. More than 60 have been injured. Arshan O'Shea was inside the skeleton of the building today and has our top story tonight from Ukraine with more on the search for survivors. Security video shows the moment of impact. The shockwave sends a man in the water at a neighboring park. A shopping mall has just been attacked. Fire engulfs the largest mall in the Ukrainian city. Authorities say a thousand shoppers have been inside when they say an air-launched X-22 cruise missile struck the building. Some people got out to safety after hearing a warning alarm. Others were not so fortunate. Rescue crews moved in as quickly as possible. Within hours, Ukraine's president addressed the attack. Russia's strike on the mall is one of the most daring terrorist attacks in the history of Europe, said Volodymyr Zelensky. Ukrainian authorities put out a table, displayed pieces they say are from the attacking missile. The attack took place as members of the G7 met in Germany. You could feel the whole mood of the meeting become yet more uh, somber. We condemn these attacks and our hearts go out to the victims and their loved ones. It's important that the world doesn't lose its attention and focus over what's happening in Ukraine. The morning after the attack, the search continued inside the mall. This is something you wouldn't see in Canada. Journalists have been allowed to come into the rescue area, and you can see firefighters behind us using their hands to pick through the rubble. They're looking for bodies. Search dogs joined the effort too. Russia's foreign minister denied what happened, instead claiming Russia's missile successfully hit a hangar storing weapons and ammunition nearby. Russian military spokesperson wrongly claimed that that hangar detonated a non-functioning shopping center. But that's not true. War crimes prosecutors have been pouring over the scene, sizing up their latest case against Russia. One described the Kremlin's intentions this way. They like kill people, actually. We see that they like shelling uh, houses, hospitals. Some Ukrainians living here say they have to keep fighting. What would be your message to Russians today? Please stop us. We want to live in peace. Across the street from the mall, other businesses are patching up from the collateral damage they sustained. And people like Anna are simply at a loss for words to describe what this latest attack means to them. Never, never words, just feelings. And uh, it's like, it's too much for everything of us. Does it hurt? Yes. This attack is now the country's highest profile war crimes investigation, a focal point for what Russia's doing to civilians. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Kremenchuk, Ukraine. Prime Minister Trudeau announced new financial support for Ukraine at the conclusion of the G7 summit in Germany this morning. Canada will provide $152 million in new money for humanitarian security and development purposes. Canada will also loan the country $200 million for urgent financial obligations. Trudeau traveled to Spain this afternoon ahead of the NATO summit in Madrid. International diplomacy was well at work before the summit. Turkey is agreeing to support the membership bid of Finland and Sweden after the three countries reached a deal to address Turkey's security concerns. David Aiken is traveling with the Prime Minister and tells us why this meeting of world leaders could be the most consequential of them all. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Spain for his 
fourth and final summit of world leaders in as many weeks, and this one, a meeting of NATO heads of government, is shaping up to be the most consequential of them all. NATO leaders arrived ready to chart a new course for the 73-year-old alliance by finalizing a new strategic concept, its most significant shift since the Cold War. It will address China for the first time and the challenges that Beijing poses to our security, interests and values. But the most pressing threat right now, of course, is Russia. NATO leaders are expected to approve plans to beef up defenses on the eastern or Russia-facing flank of the alliance, and they'll discuss how to boost the NATO Rapid Response Force from 40,000 personnel to a whopping 300,000. But it's not clear how much capacity Canada has to help. New figures published by NATO itself show that defense spending in Canada measured in constant dollars dropped by 3% last year compared to the year before. And over the last five years, defense spending by Canada has been shrinking by an average of 1% each year. Canada is always uh, part of NATO missions and continues to step up significantly. Um, Canadians expect to do that, us to do that in a responsible and um, reflective way. But back home, even Trudeau's top general has not been able to say where he's getting a promised $4.9 billion boost for continental defense. I can't say definitive, de definitively where it's coming from. And the Prime Minister Tuesday offered little precision. These are extremely important investments that we've made. Uh, they are fully sourced. Now, using the arguably flawed measure of defense spending as a percentage of a country's GDP, NATO said this week that Canada this year will spend 1.27% of its GDP on defense. That is the lowest level since 2016, and compared to all the 29 other members of the NATO alliance, that's good enough for Canada to be in 24th place ahead of Slovenia and Luxembourg. Colleen. David Aiken in Madrid. Thanks, David. Breaking news out of British Columbia, John Horgan is stepping down as premier of the province. After weeks of speculation, Horgan made the announcement this afternoon, saying he's not able to make another six-year commitment to the job. It's uh, uh, not a secret that I have uh, gone through uh, my second bout of cancer and uh, successfully went through 35 radiation treatments and, are, and I am currently cancer-free. My health is good but my energy uh, flags uh, as the days go by. Global's Richard Zussman joins us from Victoria. Richard, this is the end of the road for one of the country's most popular premiers. It sure is, Colleen, and he will remain on until the NDP chooses a new leader. So that will be in the fall. But it did come as a big surprise that Horgan decided today to announce the resignation, especially considering in less than two weeks' time, he will be welcoming premiers from across the country here to Victoria to debate health care transfers and to try to put pressure on the federal government to get more health funding for all of the provinces. But Horgan says he did not want this conversation around his future to be a distraction around the decision on health care and the other important measures his government is working on here right now, including housing affordability. So Horgan ultimately conceded that today was the right day to announce he would be stepping down, moving aside to continue to focus on those core priorities and hope that Ottawa will give one last feather in his cap with some additional money for health care for all Canadians. Colleen, back to you. Richard Zussman in Victoria. Thanks, Richard. Breaking news near Victoria, B.C. Global News has confirmed six police officers have been injured during an exchange of gunfire near a bank. <laughs> Police say they responded to a report of armed suspects at a Bank of Montreal in the community of Saanich. Five officers were shot while a sixth suffered unknown injuries. Two suspects have been killed. The search for a possible third suspect is ongoing and nearby homes and businesses are being evacuated due to the threat of a possible explosive device. 
In the United States, stunning new testimony took center stage at the January 6th committee hearings in Washington today. A former aide in Donald Trump's White House shared a behind-the-scenes look at the chaos taking place within the administration and the demands from the former president to let his people in as the violent insurrection took place on the Capitol in 2021. Jackson Prosko was following the hearings for us today. Jackson. Colleen, the revelations came from Cassidy Hutchinson, a former aide to Trump's chief of staff. She was in the room during many of these key moments on and before the 6th. Hutchinson described Trump's rally outside the White House on the morning of the 6th, saying the Secret Service had warned that people in the crowd were armed and they were actually confiscating weapons at security checkpoints. Trump allegedly demanded that security be loosened, in part so that he could grow the crowd outside the White House for the cameras. I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. We also learned that Trump personally wanted to join the mob in the march to the Capitol to interrupt the election certification. And when the Secret Service wouldn't let him travel to the Capitol building, he apparently became enraged inside the presidential limo. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. Jackson, if Trump knew the mob was violent, had weapons and didn't intervene to stop it, did he commit a crime? Well, no doubt that question is being asked inside the Justice Department right now. Remember, they're investigating seditious conspiracy charges against several extremist groups. The question, does that link directly back to Trump or the White House? The committee today also warned that there have been several attempts from Trump's inner circle to intimidate the witnesses they're currently interviewing. Colleen? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Jackson, thank you. At least 50 deaths have now been linked to a tragic discovery near the Texas-Mexico border late last night. We're not supposed to open up a truck and see stacks of bodies in there. Um, none of us come to work imagining that. The bodies were found in the back of a tractor trailer on a remote back road in rural San Antonio in what's presumed to be a migrant smuggling attempt. More than a dozen survivors, including children, were taken to hospital. As Eric Sorensen reports, the tragedy comes as border authorities struggle with a surge of attempted crossings. This tractor trailer, supposed to be a gateway to a new life, became a sweltering coffin for dozens of migrants. A horrific human tragedy. Individuals. Uh, who are no longer with us, who had families, um, who were likely trying to find uh, a better life. De pobreza, de... It is from poverty and desperation, said Mexico's president, speaking of the Hondurans, Guatemalans and Mexicans identified among the dead so far. The sad reality is the deaths in Texas are but one tragedy in a resurgent humanitarian crisis. Tens of thousands of migrants are on the move toward the United States. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, fewer than 50,000 migrants per month were stopped crossing the U.S. border. The numbers spiked last year to 200,000, and in 2022, record numbers. In May alone, 239,000 so-called border encounters in the southwestern U.S. It is human misfortune with no easy political solution. President Biden is faulted by Republicans for having open borders. But experts in migration say the crisis stems from governments denying migrants a proper refugee process. So they resort to desperate tactics to sneak in. It becomes a job creation program for smugglers and it makes crossing, entering more dangerous. In Canada, the number of so-called irregular migrants has been small. Quarterly figures in the low hundreds during the worst of COVID-19. But in the first three months of this year, the numbers jumped to over 2,700. And while Ottawa has vowed to take in 4,000 refugees from the Americas by 2028, it will hardly make a dent in the mass migration. It's important to remember that 85% of the world's refugees are actually uh, hosted by countries in the global south, not by countries like uh, the United States or indeed Canada. God willing, the United States, says this Colombian migrant, we want a better future. But the reality that awaits them is often dire and sometimes deadly. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. 
Long COVID has long left doctors and patients puzzled. Coming up, what Canadian researchers have just discovered. As COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations begin to wane across Canada, there are still thousands of people suffering the effects months, even years after infection. Scientists are trying to unravel the mystery known as long COVID. And now, as Jamie Morocco reports, Canadian researchers may have found a key clue. Olympic gold medalist Alex Kopach is used to being out of breath behind his bobsled. But last year, when the then 31-year-old caught COVID, he felt his breath taken away like never before. I was in hospital for uh, five days. Um, I was having oxygen uh, for about, I want to say it was, almost, it was almost two months. It took about four months after he was released, Kopach says, before he could breathe normally again. At Western University, scientists are now a step closer to figuring out why. So these people look normal clinically and their chest CTs were also quite normal. Lead researcher Grace Perega and her team used a special MRI, five times more sensitive than a CT scan, to zoom in on Kopach's airways. What we found was that exchange of oxygen from the air and the alveoli into the red blood cells was abnormally low. Red blood cells are responsible for the transportation of oxygen from your lungs to the rest of your body. Any disruption in this flow triggers your brain to command the lungs to breathe more, resulting in a feeling of breathlessness. Of 34 unvaccinated participants in Western study, only 12 of them who had been hospitalized by COVID, all had the same abnormality. Having an identifiable abnormality that fits with their symptoms is satisfying versus everybody, you know, being labeled as somebody who's suffering from long COVID and, you know, people telling them it's in their mind, it's, it's a cognitive thing. Now researchers hope to understand why COVID is causing this abnormality. More than a year after his bout with the virus, Kopach, who has recovered, hopes identifying the trigger will lead to treatments. Um, and knowing the severity of, of, of some of these diseases might give us better tools to work with uh, the recovery process. Shedding light on a disease we still know very little about. Jamie Morocker, Global News, Toronto. Problems pumped up just ahead. The tightening grip of soaring gas prices and how to loosen it. By now, you don't need us to tell you how high gas prices are soaring in this country or why. Surging costs have forced many Canadians to rethink their summer plans. Well, that may be a minor inconvenience, but as Anne Gaviola reports, new polling shows just how far the surging price at the pumps is driving widespread financial hardship and straining our daily routines. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's very difficult. Yeah, I don't know why the prices are this high, but uh, we can't control it. Summer road trip season and the return to the office, the surging price of gas couldn't have come at a worse time. You have the food costs, the clothing costs, um, all of the different things that go into having go into the office um, and including the, the inflationary costs of food, whether you're bringing it yourself or, or going out for lunch, uh, these are all adding up. For some households, it means really staying put for a staycation. For others, it will mean real financial hardship. In new Ipsos polling conducted exclusively for Global News, nearly 70% of respondents said they may not be able to afford gas anymore. That number includes a whopping 80% of parents with young children and nearly 8 out of 10 young workers aged 18 to 34. 77% of respondents are driving long distances less. About half say they can't afford to fill up, which means more day-to-day -day planning. Gas prices are high, it costs more money. <laughs> There's plenty of parks close by, so we can use them. Lower income households are least able to afford and manage sky high gas prices. But there are tried and true things you can do to make your gas money go further, easing off on the gas and the brakes when you drive, for example, and ditching any extra weight in your vehicle, like winter tires or spares in the trunk. If you can download a gas app to look for the cheapest gas in your area, I know a lot of people who are using public transit and walking and cycling a lot more than they ever were before, as well as just planning their trips, being a little bit more strategic. Gas analysts can't say for certain if there's relief in store this summer. It depends on the war in Ukraine and how damaging the hurricane season south of the border will be. 
$3 a liter seems to be the predominant view, although a lot of people think that it's going to go to $2 a liter as well. But there's very few people who think that the price of fuel is going to go down uh, in the next little while. Either way, it's likely to be a crude awakening. And Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Small satellite, big hopes. The pivotal role a tiny device plays in our possible return to the moon. Next. It has been 50 years since the last manned mission to the moon, but today NASA took a step towards returning astronauts to the lunar surface. A small spacecraft was launched from New Zealand. As Ross Lord reports, it'll study the orbit where NASA plans to build a space station for stops to and from the moon. Earth's moon is the only place beyond our planet where humans have set foot. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. More than a half century later, there's a return in the works. Three, two, one. It's called the Capstone Mission. NASA making a new path around the moon to clear the way for astronauts to eventually set foot again on its surface. NASA teamed up with two private companies at a relatively low cost of about 30 million U.S. dollars. A satellite about as big as a microwave oven will create the new orbit, sending crucial information almost 400,000 kilometers back to Earth. If we can set up a base camp of sorts on the moon, we can learn even more about what it takes for humans to thrive and survive on these different and uh, difficult environments. In the near term, there are other moon pursuits including a Canadian company that intends to support the mining of energy called Helium-3. If you mine that and bring it here, you have good source of renewable energy without the harm of radioactive uh, material. The moon's weak atmosphere and lack of liquid water make it impossible for humans to live there, but the prospects for another visit are coming more sharply into view. Ross Lord, Global News. And that is Global National for this Tuesday night. I'm Colleen Christie. Tonight's Your Canada is Horseshoe Canyon, west of Drumheller, Alberta. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Eric Sorensen will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Good night.